Okay, we've got a few in. So, I'm, my name is Martin Cullip. I'm chair of the New Nicotine Alliance. Uh, welcome to from a sweltering UK to tonight's webinar featuring a stellar lineup. Uh, first one will be done. We've had multiple speakers, so I hope you enjoy it. For those of you who are not familiar with Zoom, we'll start with some housekeeping notes. Firstly, you're all muted and your screen sharing is off. Uh, there's no chance you're going to be just thrown up on screen at any time, so don't worry about that. Just sit back and enjoy the show. Our guest speakers will speak for a few minutes each. Uh, I might ask them some questions, but once they've all said their piece, uh, we will go into the Q&A. Now, to participate in the Q&A, you need to find the Q&A function if you're not familiar with it. Uh, we're going to keep to time, but we'll ask as many questions as we can in that time. The Q&A function button, you should find it if you're in the app. Uh, it should be a menu at the bottom, or if you're on an iPad or an iPhone, touch the screen and it should come up. You can't miss it. It's an icon that just says Q&A on it. Please put your questions in there. You can put them in under your own name, or if you feel like it, you can put them anonymously. Um, but please do put the questions in there. Don't. There is a chat function. Don't put them in the chat function because I won't see them and they're very unlikely to be asked. Uh, you have no need to wait to ask questions. If there's anything that anyone says that you would like to ask a question about, just put it in that Q&A and, uh, and when it comes to the time, we can pick them out from, from the list. Another function of the Q&A is that you can upvote questions if you like them. So if you see something that either you wanted to ask or you're interested in hearing the answer from which someone else has asked, please click a little thumbs up button next to the answer and it will upvote it. So obviously the ones that are most popular have got more chance of being asked. I won't, I won't say I'm going to stick to that completely. You know, if there's a very interesting question further down, then obviously we'll, we'll ask that too. So um, lastly, we are a consumer association. We are solely reliant on private donations. So this has a cost and we're all doing this in our own free time. So please, if you can, if you're in the UK, you can donate to us by text, simply by texting NNA and the donation amount to 70085. On our website, we have further donate, donation methods. Uh, you can find our website at, sorry, that's the Twitter, nnalliance.org, and there's a page there on how to donate. So without further ado, let's get on. We are, we are talking tonight about novel nicotine products, and it's not all about vaping. The reason we say that is because in the UK, we're all very well aware of e-cigarettes, um, but they're not the only harm reduction products available out there. If you're in other countries, for example, you might hear about other products. It's just that in, this, in the UK, the dominant product is e-cigarettes. Uh, the other pro products are such as pasteurized tobacco, known as snus, uh, reduced risk, risk products which heat tobacco instead of burning, uh, nicotine pouches, we're gonna delve into all of those today, but there are also dissolvables, and there's even a first medically licensed inhaler um, called Voke. So there are all these different options and they're all on a continuum of risk uh, delivering nicotine, um, but they're all safer than cigarettes, obviously. Um, we'll start off with snus. Now, um, many may not know about snus. It was banned in the UK in 1984 and then in the EU in 1992. It's not banned in Sweden because when they acceded to the uh, EU, they carved out an exemption prior to a referendum they had in 1994. It was part of their conditions of entry that they didn't have, have a ban on snus. As a result of this, the smoking prevalence rate in Sweden is the, by far the lowest in the EU, as is the amount of uh, smoking related diseases in the country. And also in Norway, which isn't in the EU, but it's kind of affiliated, I don't know how, I'm not, I'm not into how the EU works too much. Uh, they have a, a much lower smoking rate as well because their uh, snus is available there. Um, the, I think the prevalence rate of women smokers in Norway is just 1%. Um, it was revisited in the last TDP, uh, T TPD um, last time round, and unfortunately they, they perpetuate the ban on snus. In the USA, in October last year, it got a, a modified risk tobacco products uh, classification, which means that they can make um, claims of reduced risk over in the US. Um, and uh, we're going to bring in Mark Oates, who is the NNA's expert on snus. Um, he's going to come in. The NNA wrote an article last year on snus uh, uh, in, in light of the USA, bringing in this MRTP. And Mark was quoted, uh, quoted as saying, it is inexplicable why the EU continues to perpetuate the ban on snus on EU smokers choosing to switch to snus. And, uh, and I kind of agree with him. So 
Hello, Mark. Do you want to um, give us the rundown on snus and nicotine pouches and the whole category, and just and give us your idea of you know of your experience as a as a consumer of them as well? Sure, Martin. Yeah, that's great. Thank you very much. Um, if you can hear a train going past, I apologise. I'm currently living next to a, a train line. Um, snus and the newer nicotine pouches, they're probably the most misunderstood of all the uh, nicotine categories in the UK. In fact, uh, about two years ago, I was giving a talk and I had three minutes to speak on the subject. And I undenared about uh, explaining what snus was, but I thought I wanted to avoid patronising the audience. So I didn't. And uh, I thought it went well. And then run right after we finished, two nice ladies came over to me and said, very interesting talk, but what on earth is snus? So I seemed to have sort of failed before I'd even started. Um, Swedish snus is an oral nicotine product and it's pasteurized. And that's very important because uh, chewing tobacco isn't pasteurized. And that does mean that it's different. It has a lower uh, number of carcinogens. Um, and I'm just going to try and bring up now because it's a bit hard to explain a product with, without showing some photos. I'm going to share you my screen. I'm going to show some of the products. You should be able to see that now. So these are the different type of Swedish snooses available. Um, you've got loose snoos. Uh, snus has been available in Sweden for over 200 years. And uh, as I said, it's a pasteurized tobacco. And originally with the loose snus, it would come in a tub, which if you can still see my screen is, is like this. And you would take it and you would clump it together and portion it yourself. And then you would put it uh, between your lips and the, uh, your gums. And the, the nicotine goes through the mucous membrane. About 50, 60, 70 years ago, it became a thing whereby rather than having to mess around making your own portion, uh, they developed what's called an original portion. And this is effectively like a small tea bag. And it means there's no mucking around. You can put it straight into your top lip and you can get the nicotine uh, going through your system. And that became very popular. And actually, Swedish snus was in many ways a bit like um, old ale drinking. Uh, it wasn't particularly popular, but then about 30 or 40 years ago, it became a bit like craft beer is today, very popular. And more and more young men in particular started to use it. Uh, one of the reasons they think that it became popular was uh, Sweden has and had a uh, national service and you couldn't smoke when you're on duty. And there was an opportunity where you could continue to use nicotine products uh, without having to smoke whilst you're in the army. So that's one of the reasons given why it became so, so popular. Uh, a new version of uh, the portion came out called white portion. This is very similar to the original portion, but it does have some sort of filler material uh, and, and it's not directly as, as much nicotine. And so it can be more comfortable for people when they put it in their gum. Uh, one thing that happens when you start using uh, tobacco snooze and you put it in your, your gum, you can sometimes have a stinging sensation. Over time, as you begin to use it, that, that can subside. Um, but the, the white portion was, was an attempt to try and reduce that. Uh, and our friend Bengt, who, who many will have heard of, has created his own version of snus, which is sting-free snus, and that has an extra layer on it to protect the gum even further and mean that new people to snus are not put off by that stinging. Um, now in the UK, because it's been banned, uh, there's a new product that's come out called Nicotine Pouches. And again, effectively, it's a very similar product, but it's not got tobacco in. And that means it can get round the ban on tobacco snus. We're seeing them being sold in lots of stores. Uh, Tesco's and Waitrose and Sainsbury's are all selling different brands from different companies. Um, and just to give you an example, here's a photo of how to use both snus or nicotine pouches. They're used in a very similar way. Uh, they just You just pop it up between your teeth uh, or sorry, between the gum above your teeth and um, the lip. In terms of the legality, uh, as we said, tobacco snus is illegal in the UK. It's illegal to sell it, but it's not legal. It's not illegal to possess it. So I've got my snus here. I'm perfectly entitled to have it in my possession. I'm perfectly entitled to purchase it as well. So today I actually purchased some snus. I uh, met a gentleman and. I was taking part in a legal activity. He was technically breaking the law. What I would say is when I 
investigate and, and, and study the snus market in the UK, the police have no interest in arresting anyone. Um, I found no records of them arresting anyone for selling snus. So although it is technically illegal, it's not something the police care about. And I think that's absolutely right. I don't think it's in the public interest for them to go after people selling snus. Um, in fact, the gentleman with me today informed me that he'd recently been pulled over by the police and they absolutely they knew exactly what it was and they, they didn't care, they didn't have a problem with it. He said that a few years ago, uh, he was pulled over by the police and he had to explain what it was. But again, they didn't care. So he was sort of suggesting they seem themselves to have learned about the product. Trading standards, they seem only really interested in what's sold in shops. So they're not really bothered by the, the, the man on the street selling it to his mates. You've got a lot of people from Sweden selling it to other Swedish people. You've got people in, uh, in the city, in Canary Wharf. And that's a big area where people purchase it because they don't want to have to go down uh, to, to the smoking area to consume nicotine. So they can sit at their desk. And this actually is a broad, broader uh, advantage to snoops in that you don't have to, you can do it on a plane, uh, whereas vaping, you can't. Same with heat not burn, which we'll talk about later. Um, in terms of the legality, it's looking like the government is now very interested in potentially legalizing it. Uh, we've got the tobacco related products regulation review taking place next May 2021. And the noises from the government from parliamentary questions are that they, are, they, they, they may be taking a scientific approach, a harm reduction approach, and they could therefore legalize. Uh, it's illegal for us because we're in the EU and that law was passed across as we left, um, but it may not stay that way. And I think it's a great opportunity for us to diverge from the EU, uh, reduce uh, the number of deaths from smoking, reduce the number of smokers. Uh, so let's watch this space. Um, in terms of the safety of tobacco snus, tobacco snus is actually the longest running, the product with the most history as a harm reduction tool. We've got years and years of data from Sweden. Sweden has the lowest uh, cancer rate in men in the EU. And this is because the men are very likely to use snus um, compared to smoking. They've got an incredibly low smoking rate. Uh, the women, they're not so fussed about using snus for some reason, uh, and they have a higher smoking rate. And because of that, their cancer rates are more like the rest of Europe. One thing that is often raised with me, uh, I explained that you know snus is safer, someone will jump and say, yes, but it causes mouth cancer. Now, there's a, a major difference between the chewing tobacco in America, as I said, that is not pasteurized, that's actually fermented, and that can lead to slightly more carcinogens. The data and the evidence on Swedish snus, much lower carcinogens, and a, a large study recently came out, 400,000 men says there's no link between oral cancer and Swedish snus. Um, in regards to the legality of nicotine pouches, as I said, that was brought in to avoid the, the ban on uh, tobacco snus. So they're currently legal, but they aren't regulated in, in, in their own entity. They fall under a general products uh, regulation. That is an area where it might and probably should be developed to make sure that the product is uh, probably got a few more rules around it so that actually it can end up doing a... Uh, a better job and not causing any issues with potentially too high a uh, nicotine rate. Um, before I finish, I think what I would say is that what snus and tobacco snus shows us is that the, the damage when it comes to nicotine use is being caused by combustion. It's not a tobacco versus non-tobacco fight necessarily, it's, it's a combustion versus non-combustion. We'll talk about heat not burn later. That's obviously got tobacco in, but it's not, not no combustion, it's not burnt. Same with tobacco snus, it's, it's not comb combustible and, and it's safer. So we need to sort of change those prejudices and make sure ultimately as many products are available to the consumer because for one person, vaping may not work and they want some other form of nicotine and they may want snus. So if you legalize snus, that's another opportunity for them. And if we want, um, maybe some people want to use heat not burn. Uh, some people want to use nicotine pouches. Ultimately, the more choices we can offer people, the more we can reach that goal of 2030 being smoke free. Thanks, Martin. Okay, if you turn screen sharing off. Um, oh, yeah. I know how to do it. Has that worked? Yeah, that's, that's worked. Um, I, I just want to ask, 
a question because you've mentioned in Sweden that it became popular perhaps because of national service. Now, you first got into SNUS in the reservists, didn't you? Do you want to tell us uh, how that is? So you had the same effect yourself, didn't you? Yeah, so I, I'm, I'm still a member of the Army Reserves. And uh, frankly, if you're smoking a cigarette, then there's a real risk that a sniper might see you because you've got the heat signature from the cigarette, you've got the smell and you've got the smoke. Uh, whereas you can use a snus and avoid detection. Uh, in fact, I understand in the Special Forces in America and Britain, they, they use snus themselves. In fact, I joke that maybe Sweden should put a health warning on their snus and saying, warning, using snus may save your life from a sniper. Yeah. <laughs> um, uh, the, uh, I'll ask one question that we've got in the Q&A already because I wouldn't mind knowing this as well because I get asked this occasionally and I, I don't really know the answer. Uh, um, where is it gone? Where is it gone? Hold on. Um, can you just clarify what's in the nicotine pouch? You know, we know that in the in tobacco snus, it's tobacco, pasteurized tobacco. But what actually is the carrying agent in nicotine pouches? So it's got a, a chemical nicotine product. Is that a cat going past you? <laughs> yes, it's every week. Every week my cat <laughs> comes in and invades me. Yeah. <laughs> Predominantly, you've got nicotine in it, but obviously the nicotine itself is not going to fill a whole pouch. Um, so it has various sort of fillers, very similar to sort of food grade fillers you might have in, you know, your paracetamol tablet, for example, has paracetamol in, but the amount of paracetamol does not fill the whole tablet. So they put food grade fillers in. Right. Okay. Okay. Um, okay. Okay. We're going to bring in our next, our next guest, Jeff Souza. Now, Jeff is a chartered financial advisor and consumer of, of heated tobacco products. Um, now, heat, heat not burn, as it's called, it, it, it heats to below the point of combustion. So it creates an aerosol by not going above 400 degrees from what my understanding of it. It's sold in around 50 countries. In Japan and South Korea, as we said, it's not all about vaping in the UK. We know all about e-cigarettes. In Korea and Japan, the big story is, is heat not burn products over there. In Japan, I think it, it the smoking rate plummeted by about a third in a few years. Uh, and there were something like 15 million users of this worldwide. And yet not many people take it up in this country. I mean, it was quite difficult to find a, a, a consumer in this country. It's not a great take up. Um, it's in, in America, it's had a pre-market trade and, uh, authorization, which says it's appropriate for the protection of public health. And there's been an application submitted for a modified risk tobacco product as well, which hasn't been decided on the, yet. And in the UK, the Committee on Toxicity in 2017 said that it was likely that heat not burn products would be 50 to 90 percent less harmful than smoking tobacco. So um, welcome, Jeff. Um, you use these products. You use heat, heat not burn products. You've, you used to be a smoker and you quit using these about two years ago. Do you want to tell us how you got into it and, and what your experiences yeah. are, pros and cons, all that sort of stuff? Good evening, everyone. Um, I, I, I was actually a really heavy smoker. So I'd leave home with uh, three to four packs and pretty much smoke them. Um, and I have quit using nicotine patches, but um, always kept coming back to, to smoking. Uh, I don't know, maybe you have a drink too many or something, you're at a dinner party and you end up drinking and someone offers you a cigarette and you start all over again. Um, so I started on, on heats possibly about four years ago, uh, being, being introduced uh, by my neighbor who who, who's into the tobacco industry and knows all about these things. And uh, Martin, you're right that in Japan it is huge um, uh, and they have kind of more flavors than anywhere else. Um, and they, I, I think the thing about heats, um, one of the biggest problems, first of all, I'll, I'll say is why, why people are possibly reluctant to, to start it or, or know about it is the initial cost. Um, so actually buying the actual, um, uh, the machine to, to uh, smoke with um, costs a lot more. Now the packet of cigarettes has come down from eight or nine pounds to five pounds a packet. It's easily available in, in uh, Sainsbury's, et cetera, or online. Um, and it's kind of delivered the next day um, at no extra cost. Um, I think the beauty of it is that, it, one, if I can give up, I think pretty much anyone can give up. Um, it, it just takes a bit of getting used to because it's not as strong as a cigarette. Um, 
even though my particular thing is made made by Marlboro and I'm kind of smoking Marlboro lights, um, it takes a bit of time to get used to. And uh, but once you're used to it, the, it, it's easy to to carry on smoking. I I, I obviously smoke less because. Um, I don't know uh, if if anyone's seen them, but but that's the packet of, of heats, and and that's the size of the cigarette. And it, as you all said, it, it doesn't burn; it just heats up. Um, you probably get about 14 puffs out of it, and and that's it. You know, which is kind of plenty. Now I know they've introduced a new one whereby you can have two lots of smokes if you like. Uh, one after another. Otherwise, the charging from one to the next probably takes about two minutes, um, which I'm sure most people can wait for. I, uh, apart, uh, I, I think the cost, what, once you've, you've factored in the cost and the cost of the, the actual heats, the cigarettes, um, it'll work out a lot cheaper if you're a smoker. So, uh, there are different flavors if, if people are into flavors or, you know, you can have cigarette flavor or they, they do a ment menthol, uh, even though I think menthol is now banned, is it in the UK? Uh, I'm sure someone will correct me. But they do a version of it, which, which is um, al allowable. So I, I think it, it's easy, it's uh, easy to carry. A, you, a lot of places allow, allow you to smoke it even internally because it doesn't smell, it doesn't um, give off huge flumes of smoke or anything like that. And, and, um, and I don't think anyone can actually detect it unless, you know, you, you had a really good nose and you were looking for it kind of thing. Um, the, the actual cigarette thing is that small and you, you just pull it out and, and it's that it's that size, and then you stick a, one of those cigarettes in and, and puff away. So um, I, I think if, if, if people want to give up smoking, uh, as you all rightly said, there, there should be more options. There should be, you know, but I know Heats and Icos actually give you a trial. So if you don't like it, you can return it. Um, in the first instance, so I would say it's another option, and and it's something you know that that people ought to look into. Yeah. Okay. Thanks. Thanks, Jeff. Uh, I, I agree with you on on the cost. I've I've tried an Icos myself in the Icos store in London, um, and I thought it was it was a fairly pleasant experience. It was it was nice with a cup of coffee. Um, but it was the cost. I thought lots of people were going to be put off by the cost. I also agree that it takes time to get used to. I expect because I'm I'm a vapor, and you know it, it took me five years to transition completely over to vapor. It took me a long time. Some people just it they just like it straight away. Others it takes a while. So I agree with that. I'm I'm interested. Firstly, I think I'll that just the vapor, Martin, I'll just add one more thing before you ask a question. Yeah. I, I think it's you know for for a smoker they like having something in their hand. Um, you know, whether you're vaping or, or using one of these, it's that extension and having that uh, sort of cigarette feeling in your hand if you're previously a smoker. Um, so, so I think this kind of helps. Yeah, I think that's the same appeal with vaping as well, isn't it? It's, it's yeah. that hand to mouth action. But yeah, on the menthol, as I understand it, the menthol heats are not, are not banned. Um, I am interested um, in in the fact that you're calling it smoking. Now, one thing I've always said is a bit of a problem for people using heat not burn products is, is whereas with e-cigarettes, people can call it vaping, which distinguishes from smoking. There doesn't seem to be a similar description of using um, a heated tobacco product rather than a, a regular cigarette. Um, do, you, do you know any words? You know, are you um, no, <laughs> heaters or? I don't know any words. I'm not going around and, and saying, oh, I'm, I'm doing a heat, you know, at the moment. Yeah. Um, yeah. No, no. So it, it hasn't it hasn't got a name as such. I I haven't come across anything. Um, so so I've just re reverted to just calling it smoking. Yeah. And it, it might make me feel better saying I'm still smoking or something. I don't know. <laughs> yeah, yeah, um, yeah. And it's it's important to say that it's not only 
uh, tobacco companies making the devices at least. You know, anyone who's been to Vapor Expo or Vape Jam or places like that will see that, that the Chinese especially have got lots of independent makers of these things. Um, and in, in, in Korea, South Korea, the market plummeted so much. And I think South Korea has got a nationalized tobacco industry that that tobacco industry was forced to go out and try and dis design, manufacture and market their own heat, not burn product because their basically their, their bottom line was just plummeting at a dramatic rate. So it's something that over there is, is like I said, over here, it's, it's what it's not all about vaping over there. They might be saying it's not all about heat, not burn. Who knows? You know? Yes, um, but I, I also think that these tobacco companies have realized people are trying to give up smoking or looking for alternatives. And, and all the big players um, are all coming up with alternatives. So this is made by Philip Morris. I know BAT do have their own version. Um, so they, I, I, they're forced to come up with this. Otherwise they will be nationalized or, or go out of business. Yeah, and you have Plume, Plume Technologies and PAX in the US as well. So it's, it's a wider thing. There's quite a bit of competition in the market. Um, I was going to say something else, but I forgot. I'm, I'm sure we'll come to it because questions are coming in. So hopefully we'll we'll get them. OK, so we're, we're going to move on now and, and bring in uh, Louise Ross, who's the vice chair of the NNA. Um, Louise uh, worked in learning disability for 30 years, uh, but from 2014, 2004 to 2018, uh, she was responsible for Leicester's Stop Smoking Service becoming the first e-cig friendly service in the country. And of course, now there are many more. Um, she's very, very well known by Vapors. Um, so welcome. Uh, Louise, I'd just like to ask how you see these products fit in in the general uh, harm reduction category. Um, like uh, like Jeff said, it, he he didn't get on with vaping, but heat not burn worked for him. You know, that, there is a continuum of risk. We know that heat not burn products are more dangerous than e-cigarettes, or let or more harmful than e-cigarettes. And e-cigarettes are less harmful than those. And snus is probably less harmful than e-cigarettes. So. Uh, we have a national tobacco control plan for England, which says they, they, they want to maximise the availability of safer products. So how do you see all this fitting in? Thanks, Martin. I think it's a matter of giving smokers choice and, you know, n nothing will, th there's no product that will suit everybody. Um, everybody's different. And in the stop smoking services, we very much know that. And we, we had, uh, you know, b before tobacco harm reduction, we had a number of different options, you know, the, the, the different presentations of NRT, uh, Champix, Zyban, uh, all those sort of things, then vaping came along. But now I think, um, stop smoking advisors are being asked <coughs> about um, you know, other products and, and part of the reason for putting this webinar together uh, was for the, the demand from, from the team I manage now for information about products that they were being asked about but didn't know enough about. And okay, you can, you can use a search engine to, to look up uh, different products, but actually hearing consumers talk about it uh, is is absolutely fascinating. So I'm very grateful to Mark and Jeff for, for giving their experiences and I've learned a lot already and I know that people listening will also get the benefit of that. Right okay um, I think we'll probably just bring everyone in right now I mean um, we'll have a, have a bit of a chat we've got plenty of questions I'm, I'm just looking through them now I'm, I'm gonna ask the, the most popular one first because it's nice and easy we'll, we'll get this one out for Mark, because Mark is a former political researcher in the House of Commons, so he could give a good question on this. What are the chances of snus being legalised for retail, retail sale in the UK in the near future, says Andrew Thompson? I think that it's uh, very possible. Previously, when we are in the EU, everyone told me it just wasn't going to happen. Um, but uh, the government has taken a more harm reduction approach. The politicians I'm speaking to in the House of Commons they're telling me the government is very keen to make a step change away from the EU to show the advantages of leaving the EU. Uh, I think this will be a big advantage, whether you agree with leaving or not. Um, and a recent parliamentary question, Jo Churchill, the minister, she answered it in a manner which suggested they are looking into this and considering it for May next year. Yeah, yeah, I think I, think I saw that parliamentary question. It's quite encouraging. and. Um, I, I don't know. Have you any view on this, Louise? Do, have you heard anything uh, from from your side of the fence on on this sort of stuff? I haven't. I think we're all we're all waiting with bated breath to to see. And I think one of the 
absolute benefits to to making the sale legal is that it will give people a chance to try something so they don't have to um you know drop the cigarettes go on to something else straight away it might be exactly as uh, as as mark said earlier that you you use it when you're at work or when you're traveling or something like that and realize that you know it's not so bad and um, we've seen people do that a lot with vaping this again gives somebody a different choice yeah yeah sure uh just looking through what else i've, I've kept I've, I've not kept up with these questions very well this week so i will i would i would ask people to use the upvote button more if you can uh because there are quite a few in there and and um, i'm sort of i'm sort of scrolling up and down but we have had a question asking if your presentation mark could be made available uh because uh Julie Newman said this, my stop smoking practitioners would find this very helpful. And I'm sure that we'll find some way of getting that to you, Julie. Um, uh, so either email the NNA or if you know, um, if you know Louise, maybe talk to her and we'll, we'll get the presentation to you somehow. Um, it'd be good if, it, if, if it's useful to you. Uh, another one for you, Mark, I think you're going to be busy. Can you explain the difference between pasteurised and fermented snus? Yeah, I mean, I can't claim to be a, a scientist or a manufacturer of snus, so perhaps not the best person, but from what I understand, uh, pasteurization of snus is very similar to, say, pasteurization of, of milk, and you heat it up to a certain level, and that effectively sort of ends the chemical reactions, and that's why it doesn't go on creating more carcinogens. Whereas with um, chewing tobacco, it's fermented, and what I think you do is you, you put all the tobacco together or you can put it in a kiln and you kind of create a humid environment with some heat but not too much heat to kill the reaction and then enzymes within the tobacco start to be released i think there's ammonia is involved um yeah and and, and it, it, it's another way of sort of curing it uh but again one of the flaws to that is it does release more carcinogens and so although there's a lot of different oral tobaccos uh and oral nicotines they're not all created equal and so I would encourage people to use Swedish snus because it is the safest of all of them alongside nicotine pouches. Uh, but I also, in the grand scheme of risk, oral nicotines are safer than smoking, but they're not all relatively as risk-free as it were. Yeah, yeah, there's differences in products within that part of the category itself, isn't there? Yeah. yeah. Um, we've got a question here and we, we'll, we'll have to talk about this because this is always going to be the question that's asked in relation to any harm reduced product. Um, it's from an anonymous attendee. Sorry about my cat again. Uh, do you think the heat products encourage young people to start using tobacco? Now, I don't know particularly um, what the figures are on this, but Jeff, I'll ask you, do you think there's appeal in heat, heat not burn products for children? I mean, I would have thought the cost would, would put them off straight away. Uh, you know, when I, when I tried to tried one just for research really i think it was 65 pounds for the device itself before you buy any any heats to go with it so what, what's your views on that yeah i i, I don't think uh, it, it's something for for that market i've got a teenage son and from what he tells me it tends to be more vaping um than than um heats um because of that initial cost. And I think vaping is a cheap alternative and uh, the gadgets look amazing and that sort of thing. And that's what they seem to be into more than um, really the smoking. It's trying to look cool. So I don't think Heats is a, a, a tobacco product that youngsters, teenagers are, are going to go out and, uh, and start smoking or, or, or taking part in. Yeah, I've always said the best way to turn children off is to say that your parents think this product is cool and then they just won't go anywhere near You're it. Right. But um, I think that should be an advertising line for a lot of these things, to be honest. Um, what are your views on that, um, Mark and Louise? Or Louise first. You, you, that's going to be the debate with any of these products, isn't it? Yeah, I, I, I mean, we, we know from uh, national surveillance that uh, even if young people experiment with vaping, there only a very, very small number go on to be regular users. And it's quite likely that those would have smoked anyway. Uh, as far as um, heated tobacco products go, uh, I think the cost is, you know, is bound to be out of their reach. If they have a, a few pounds here and there to spend, 
they're more likely to go and spend it on alcohol or something like that that they can get immediately and, and, and get a buzz from uh, rather than, than dump a whole load of money in, in buying something that, that, that doesn't look particularly sexy anyway. Yeah. Um, Mark, do you, I don't suppose you've seen any, any statistics on heat not burn specifically, have you? I know it's very low. Uh, in, uh, terms of, in terms of number of users? In um, terms of youth, really, I mean, I, I really don't know. It's, it's, it's not something that's been a big debate in this country, hence why we're having this, this webinar about heat not burn products. I'm sure there is some, and I'll, I'll look into it after this. I've made a note of it already, but uh, I don't know. Have you, have you heard anything from when you I were in Parliament? I don't think it's been mentioned that many young people are using heat not burn. Heat not burn is, is not very well known. Ultimately, that's because of uh, a thing called tapper, which prevents... Uh, the product actually being uh, prevents companies that are selling the product informing consumers about it. Uh, it's a great shame because the divide on whether you can inform the consumers through whether that's maybe advertising or information is based purely on whether it's a tobacco product or a non-tobacco product, which is a shame because we know that's not necessarily the reason uh, for the dangers to the product. Uh, ultimately, if you're going to make a fantastic policy environment tomorrow, I would say make it so that the most harmful products like smoking, combustible cigarettes, they cannot be advertised, but allow a level of information to be passed on to the consumer. Right now, I think heat not burn could do a lot better and we could be saving more lives if that information could be passed to consumers. And that's for me, I think that's the only reason why it's not as more, more, more widespread, more widespread use. Um, I haven't seen lots of young people use it. I don't think it doesn't have the same cloud plume that vaping does that may be attractive to, to, to younger people. It's also worth recognizing when we talk about young people who are maybe using a nicotine product that's safer like vaping, then they're probably the same youths that would be smoking instead. So if you were to take away uh, things like vaping, then it's not that they're just going to suddenly stop using nicotine products. They're going to be smoking instead. So we have to be rational when we, when we talk about uh, young people using these products. Yeah, I've, I've always said, um, you know, with all the threats that are out there, if I've got a, I've got a, a 20 and a 19 year, 20 year old daughter and 19 year old son. And when they were teenagers, I remember thinking if the very worst product they get hold of is, is um, a non nicotine e-cigarette, I think they've done really well considering all the threatening products are out there, including alcohol and drugs and everything else. So, um, yeah, it's, um, I've got a couple more questions for you, Jeff. Um, what Simon Pilbrow asks, what is the hit from a heat like? And I'm going to add another one in from Andrew Thompson saying, have you tried, well, he's saying, have you tried any other products apart from the ICOS? Because there is, for example, the Glow, which is, um, like you said, BAT, and, and there are other ones out there. Have, have you tried anything else? Yeah, I have, I have tried uh, some of the other products from other tobacco companies. Um, I, I, I think it was a case of flavor and I didn't like the flavor of, um, uh, let's say BAT's, um, option. Um, I, I just like the flavor of, of, uh, heat. I, I thought it was kind of more as a cigarette. Um, the nicotine level is, is seems low if you're a cigarette smoker but it, it's a case of getting used to it. it's 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 like if you're on a normal you smoke a normal cigarette and then you you switch and say oh you know uh let me go on to lights or something uh and it takes a bit of time and it's it it hasn't got that same uh hit uh but you carry on with it and and uh, you just get used to it because that that is the level of uh it or nicotine you're going to get so um, there they might be times you, when you do want to smoke two in a row, you know, because you haven't got enough of, of a hit from uh, the tobacco, uh, which is fine because um, you think about it, the size of, of what you're smoking is about a third of, of an actual cigarette. So, so even now and again, if you do need that bigger hit, then, then I, I can't see any harm in it. And I, it's obviously better than than smoking cigarettes proper. Yeah, I mean, there are, there are different strengths, I think, are there in, in heat not burn products or the, the heats? Yeah. Uh, because they, you don't actually have... burn them, do you? It's just, a, isn't it? it's just a rod that heats a section of the, the tobacco and then when you pull it out, it's all still there, isn't it? Nothing's burnt away, Correct. you just throw the thing away. 
Correct. Yeah. So nothing burns from from what I showed you earlier on the size of that uh, uh, heat, if you like. Um, that is the size that you pull out at the end of your 14 drags. Um, and um, it doesn't burn. I mean, you could put it straight into a dungeon and it's, it's not going to catch fire or anything. So, uh, yes, and they are different flavors. They are different strengths. Um, the one I use is, is kind of my preference. Um, I didn't really like the others, but, but they keep introducing more and more new ones. Um, but I, for me, I, I'm, I'm quite happy with uh, the one I use. And I don't see the point of going to try others. What was it specifically about vaping that you didn't really find uh, satisfying? You, know, you said you tried vaping first. Um, what was it that turned you off vaping? Because I, I, I'll put it in context. I run a business and we've got uh, a lot of employees and, and we used to have probably about 50% of them smoked. Uh, a lot of them are now vapors instead. Uh, but whenever someone came to me, I said the same as you, you know, don't just think this is going to be a miracle worker. Leave it at least a couple of weeks before you decide whether you want to carry on or not, because you know it takes time to get in used to. So, um, you know, what, what what was it about vaping that you, that didn't catch with you? And you know, I've always said there's a lot of people who heat not burn probably could work with. There are, I don't see many of them, I have to say, and I don't know any in my company. But what was it that that meant that you, the vaping didn't work for you and heat not burn did? Yeah, so, so when I went to buy the actual contraption, um, they had, like the one you're using, uh, these great big gadgets. And, and I just wanted something that would kind of fit in my pocket. So I went for the smallest one. Um, and then by the, by the time you try and kind of analyze all the flavors they've got, I didn't want caramel flavor or vanilla or whatever else there was there. You know, I wanted something that tasted like a cigarette. Um, so although I went ahead and got it, and then um, I, I think after a couple of weeks, I did give it a couple of weeks, but after a couple of weeks, I, I gave up because uh, something got stuck and I, I couldn't put the liquid in to, to vape and kind of gave up. But, but I was smoking at the same time. That's, that's interesting. Now, Louise, it's true, isn't it? We, we've touched on this quite a lot. In, um, in, in fact, we did a dress rehearsal, didn't we, with, uh, with um, a guy who's involved in homeless environments in Ireland. And he said that the flavours were the thing that was attracting everyone to mm. vaping. And, and they even had fights, didn't they, when, when a certain flavour wasn't. Was it berries? When berries wasn't available, they had people fighting each other you know, because they wanted this flavour. And yet Jeff here is saying he purely wanted tobacco. Now, most vapors I know, they start on tobacco, but then move on to flavours. I did that myself. I thought I want tobacco and then started on watermelon and found it was a much fresher taste. And now I vape pear drops and aniseed balls and things like that, you know, so. Um, Which, this just supports the argument that that has to be more than one solution. And, and you know, the idea of, of cutting flavours down to, to just tobacco flavour will disadvantage so many people that have transitioned away from smoking. But for some people, that's exactly what they want. And, you know, I know vapors who, who stick loyally to their tobacco flavor, hate the, the fruit flavor. But, you know, it's absolutely wrong if we want to help people away from smoking to, you know, a, a harm reduced product to say, you've got to do it this way. And, and I will always argue for, you know, the, the, the smoker, the, you know, the potential quitter, that they have to have the choice. Can I, can I ask a question? Because uh, I'm also monitoring my, my team's uh, offline discussion about this, and they're very keen to know uh, about whether uh, there is carbon monoxide in a heated tobacco product. Now, I remember seeing Leon Shahab's um, analysis of the comparison between a smoked cigarette, a heated tobacco product, and a vape, and vaping, you know, tiny, tiny uh, amounts of uh, chemical. Um, I can't remember just what there was in a heated tobacco product. Can can anybody enlighten me on that? Um, I can't. I saw the, someone's asked that in, in the Q&A and, and I can't answer it. Um, I, I've, again, I've written a note to try and find out because it's something I'm interested in myself. But uh, do, do you know, uh, uh, Jeff, have you got any idea on that? One? I, I, I don't know, but I, I guess that's possibly one of the reasons uh, a lot of countries have not allowed heats. So there's got to be an element of it. It could be. Uh, have, have you have you come across anything, Mark? I, I 
I really don't know. It's one of them, I think, which might see more research as needed. I don't know. I think we can offer to, to find out and put mm. it out as an NNA tweet. Um, yeah, and, yeah. Uh, and, and all circulate that. Yeah, yeah. okay, we'll, we'll do that. I, I can't be certain of it, but one thing I don't think that the carbon monoxide necessarily is going to be causing long term damage. From what I understand, uh, if you are someone that's consuming some carbon monoxide, then your body ends up creating more hemoglobin uh, levels. In fact, I was tested in the military. Uh, we do lots of different fitness tests where our blood's taken to try and work out our hemoglobin levels. And um, a lot of us came back and, and the doctor's report said that either one of three things, um, you're either a smoker because you've got higher hemoglobin levels or you're on some kind of steroid, which is increasing your hemoglobin levels. And I can tell you we weren't on any steroids because we get tested regularly, quite rightly in the army. Um, or the third reason is because uh, a lot of us are doing extremely high levels of exercise and therefore our body's naturally creating high hemoglobin. Okay, well, we've got a question for you next, Mark. Um, it's, uh, it's from John Fell. He says, how much of a substitute for snus do you think nicotine pouches are for you personally? And if you couldn't use snus, would you be happy to just use pouches instead? So I, I do use nicotine pouches mainly if I can't get hold of snus. It is so difficult in this country to get hold of it. So I will take the opportunity to use nicotine pouches and I, and I switch between the two. Um, but there's some nicotine pouches I like and some that I don't. There's, there's moist nicotine pouches, which is a type of nicotine pouch. And there's also dry nicotine pouches. I, I'm more fond of the dry nicotine pouches. Uh, I actually don't really smoke at all because I partly could my fitness, but I generally just prefer to use uh, snus or, or nicotine pouches. I must be. I've got some nicotine pouches. I think they're rather good products, especially as, as I think uh, someone said, I think it was really said you know, on a plane, I use them a lot on planes, but sometimes you just don't feel like a vape and you just pop in a, a nicotine pouch and they're, they're you know, I, I like the citrus ones. Again, it's the flavor. I, I like of that. Um, I, I will ask a question. A little, little fun question here uh, from anonymous attendee. Snus gives me the hiccups. What can I do to stop this? Now I've had that before uh, with Zin when I first started using six milligrams of Zin, which is a, a nicotine pouch product. Um, I seem to have got over it, so it seems to have just gone away as your tolerance. But um, what causes it, Mark? And yeah. how do you stop yourself getting it? So what they think is happening there is that particularly when you're a new user to snus or, or nicotine pouches, your body feels this thing in, in, in your mouth and it's a bit odd. And you yourself can encourage then the, the creation of saliva and you have an excess production of saliva. And what can happen is you end up swallowing that saliva and that can be what uh, sets off the hiccups. As you get used to using the product and you try and concentrate on avoiding making moisture where, where the nicotine or snus pouch is, then you're going to create less saliva and you're, you're going to be less likely to swallow it. So I'd encourage people not to, to swallow it um, as a first off. And that's probably the reason why you went from hiccuping to not hiccuping is because your body became used to it and didn't create excess saliva in your mouth. And anyone that's, once you get a little bit more experienced at using uh, snooze or nicotine pouches, you just, you, it feels completely normal in your mouth and you don't create excess saliva. Well, my, my trick was to always have some water with me to drink, to drink once that happened. So um, maybe maybe I'm not quite as tolerant as you may think I am. But um. yeah. well, also, Martin, <laughs> you know, if you put it in your mouth, and especially when you first start off using it, if you notice that 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 snooze or nicotine pouch is getting particularly moist, then I would just take it out. So when I first started using it, it would be in. It might only be in for a few minutes. Um, you know, learn learn what's going on with your mouth, and and as you progress. Uh, you, you won't, you won't, you can keep it in longer. Yeah. What, what's your view of nicotine pouches, Louise? Uh, you've obviously seen them. You know how they work. Do you think they have a, a role to play in smoking cessation services? I, I think they, they, they will appeal to some people. We, we were given some free samples and we tried them on, uh, not, not on service users, but on uh, friends and relatives who, who either smoked or vaped. And, you know, we said, you know, give these a try. Tell us what you think. Most people said they found them very, very strong and, uh, and, and didn't like them. So I wasn't over enthused about using them but I do think that they've got a, a place possibly uh, for um, people in mental health settings so somebody in the ward you know they're in a smoke-free environment they, they can't smoke they may not be able to vape I think using uh, a nicotine pouch could be just the right thing to to you know satisfy their nicotine hunger 
but you know not to not to breach the rules if you like i'd like to see that explored more yeah, interesting you say about the the um very strong i mean i i use six milligrams but i understand in some places especially russia you have insane levels of nicotine in these things um up to sort of i've seen 50 milligrams and, and even worse um now one thing i think if the tpd were to look again at the snoo span uh, would be to have some sort of upper limit uh, upper limit on the uh, strength of of snus and nicotine perhaps uh, what do you think of that mark is is that would that be a policy position that that consumers should probably go for to to increase the in integrity of the products and to and to lessen the scare the scare the scare stories that might occur if they were legalized yeah i don't think we should be scared of good regulation uh and what we saw with the tpd yeah i think there's some flaws to the tpd uh it's probably too over regulated it's probably made it harder for for smaller vape shops and smaller production so i definitely want too much regulation to stifle that competition some of that some of those regulations can end up just supporting the bigger companies uh but at the same time nothing would kill um whether that's vaping or, or nicotine pouches the, the, the category quicker then uh, no regulation and perhaps ridiculously high nicotine levels that ends up making someone ill or, or younger people getting hold of them. Um, even, I think, you know, I think it's right that we have packaging, which is, is reasonable. We don't want packaging that necessarily looks entirely like uh, sweets. It should, it should inform the consumer. It should make someone be interested in switching, but, but we shouldn't certainly be trying to encourage young, younger people to, to go for it. Uh, so, yeah, I think regulation's got a role. We saw in America with e -Valley, and um, perhaps what caused that was bad, not having a, a good level of regulation. Yeah, so uh, spe specifically in relation to nicotine pouches, for example, and snus, um, would you think a good position for vaping associations, or sorry, consumer associations like ours, to say, look, we're in favor of an upper limit of nicotine on these things, but we don't think they should be banned entirely? Mm. Yeah, I, absolutely. I think we should be trying to work with government to come up with good regulation. Uh, where that nicotine level sits, I think still some work needs to be done on that because the way that the nicotine goes into the body is not exactly the same as, as vaping. So putting it at the same level of, as vaping could be a mistake. Um, but yeah, I mean, I, I've, one problem with prohibition of snus is in the same way prohibition of alcohol in America led to very strong versions of alcohol being sold. Uh, the very similar thing happens here with, with, with snus. The, the stuff you can get hold of can be very high nicotine. It's harder to get the more uh, the lower level uh, stuff um, and that's just a cause of prohibition if you're if you're going to sell it and break the law then then you're going to go for the strongest version yeah yeah mm. right i've got a question here I, I, you might know something about hamish bowley asked can you make liquid nicotine from snooze or the new replacement I, i'd have thought there's probably not a lot in it to make out of it but is that even possible mark i've never heard of anyone doing that um i don't quite know why you would uh maybe if you're in Australia you're, you're, and you're really trying to find some way of getting hold of nicotine for your vape, but I, I, I think that'd be a bit mad. You'd have to, as above my level of understanding, you'd have to be some sort of chemist to do it, but I, I wouldn't have thought so. Uh, right, this is a question for, for everyone, really. That's just, um, do consumers care much about what company they buy their products and brand from and whether or not it's a cigarette company? Now, I can answer partially on this i know a lot i say a lot many vape reviewers really um they do not like products vape products made by the tobacco industry but at the same time i've known people who just really don't care you know and me personally i think that uh, i don't think the manufacturer is that important because i think the tobacco industry is selling completely different products from the independent industry you know, i buy all my stuff from the independent industry but i know people who work for me don't want to have all that faff of filling tanks and, and pouring liquids in and stuff like that and they prefer just to go to sainsbury's and buy a pod system made by a tobacco uh, company so uh, what do you what's your view jeff i mean would that influence you in, in your choice I, I suppose really with heat not burn it's it's, it's tobacco company products here but if if you were using a vape product would it bother you who made it no, I, I, I don't think it would bother me who made it. I, I think there's obviously a mistrust if a tobacco com company is making it uh, in that, you know, possibly what are they putting in there? Do they want me to start smoking again or uh, or something along those lines? But 
Me personally, uh, I'm not bothered who makes it. What about you, Mark? Does, does... So, I think the consumer should be free to decide for themselves. And, and that's right. If you want to buy from a, only an independent vape shop, then fine. Um, I'm not particularly anti anyone in this space. I think that I got involved because I could see that we could reduce the number of deaths vastly and massively improve uh, health of the nation. Uh, if you look at the comparison, say the car industry, now cars kill vast numbers of people every year through road traffic accidents. If, if you were to just say whether that's government or whether you were to be an individual and say, I'm not, I don't want the involvement of the car industry in making my car safer, I think that would be a massive mistake. Uh, and, and you'd be taking away someone that has a huge amount of resources to change that. Uh, so I, I think, you know, individual consumers choose quite rightly who you want to buy your products from, but I, I personally don't have any prejudice and my only aim is to try and work towards harm reduction. Right, yeah, and I'll ask you, Louise, as well on this subject, because um, I've spoken to you before about this, is um, you're in, in your space in, in the NCSET and in, in smoke and cessation services, um, there is a, a real reticence to use anything that's made by the tobacco industry, isn't it? It, it doesn't matter what it is. So the maker in your, in your area of expertise really does matter quite a lot. Yes, yes, it does. And, and it matters to service users as well. So ever since we went vape friendly uh, in 2014, many service users would say, I don't want to use a tobacco company product. And fortunately, there's a number of independent producers, you know, small and large, um, you know, that produce very, very good products. And it was always a concern to me that, that they would be swallowed up by you know, the, the big tobacco companies, because I think it's really important to maintain an independent profile in this market. Yeah, yeah. Um, we've got a question here from Joe Spinney, and this is an interesting question. Again, Louise, I've, I've spoken to you about the other cats just turned up. And <laughs> um, are there cannabis heat not burn products? And would this be a less risky way of using cannabis? Now, we've spoken about maybe doing a webinar on those products, haven't we, Louise? They're, they do exist, don't they? Well, the, you can get dry herb vaporizers, can't you? But I don't know if there's a, a, a pre-packaged cannabis product. I certainly haven't heard of that, but I, I know that people use the, the dry herb vaporizers. Perhaps that's a good subject for our next webinar then, Martin. Yeah, it's worth exploring, especially, as Mark mm. said, considering the problem with Evali over in America, which yeah. was people trying to vape, uh, vape cannabis, but putting all sorts of rubbish in it that shouldn't have been in there and isn't in in uh, nicotine e-cigarette so yeah it's definitely something to to look into um yeah. we've got a, a couple of questions from atacan before it so i mean we should talk about this because he's a a good a good advocate for for snooze mark he's basically talking about the the events going on in sweden and with sweden trying to create all sorts of um just obfuscation and, and messy science on on snooze do you know anything about that and can you explain what's going on over there it seems strange that a country which has by far the lowest smoking rate in the EU is trying to um, somehow eradicate snus, which has got a fair amount of credit to having had a part of it, you know? I can say with a lot of confidence that Atacan and Bank Weberg have done more for uh, progressing the understanding regarding snus across the world than the entire Swedish government has ever done. <laughs> for some reason the Swedish government has, has completely dropped the ball and failed uh, and in fact been anti-snooze when it comes to international development. Um, but those two gentlemen are working very hard and they've, they were pushing the Swedish government, as was the NNA uh, and myself, to try and do some studies onto uh, COVID-19 and nicotine, because unlike any other country, you've got a lot of people who are using nicotine through a non-combustible method, they're using snooze, and that could really tell us why is there some kind of protective element when it comes to people using nicotine and COVID-19, is that because of the smoking itself, the combustion, or is it because of the nicotine? Um, I understand now there is a small study going on, uh, and hopefully that will give us more answers. Uh, we had obviously that fantastic talk last week about it, but um, yeah, Sweden, Sweden for some reason took a long, long time, and I think there's a sort of a weird self-conscious feeling within the Swedish government about snooze, rather than being a champion of it, that, that they're not, and, and that's a huge mistake. Okay, I'll ask one last question. Um, just uh, give us something positive. Jeff, uh, give us something positive. What's your biggest positive um, experience of Heat Not Burn? If there's one thing you had to tell someone about the product and, and why it works for you, what, did, what would it be? 
Well, that, that's exactly it. I think it works. Um, it, it's as simple as that. And, and, and it's just a case of getting used to it. Uh, like a lot of things, you know, um, if people were to give it a try, they'd find it really easy to make the switch. Right, cool. And Mark, something positive about Snooze, you're the most positive thing, the very, the one thing, if you only had 10 seconds to say the most positive, what would be the most positive thing about Snooze? Just what Jeff does. Consumers are doing it because they want to. It's not someone telling them what they should do with their lives. They're choosing that they wish to use this product. And they, for many reasons, one of those is that it's safer. And consumer choices is great. Right. And, and the last word to you, Louise, again, in a perfect world, what do you think smoke and cessation services should be allowed to give out and which one if there was competition do you think would come out on top oh god <laughs> that's that's a rotten question <laughs> i think that's a, that's a subject for another webinar um what i will i'm not going to answer that at all uh because i i think it is down to choice what i will say is that there was an evidence review of e-cigarettes and heated tobacco products done in 2018 published by public health england if anybody wants to google it um, and it was written by some very, very um, open-minded um, leading figures in, um, in tobacco control. Um, and uh, I, on page 22, we have a little summary of uh, heated tobacco products. And uh, it, it says more or less what I said, that, uh, you know, much safer than cigarettes, not as safe as vaping, more, more studies needed. Yeah, more studies needed. I think there's going to be a lot of studies on this. Uh, we, we've seen, I think there's been something like over 3,000 studies on on vaping in just a short time that they've been around. So uh, the, the debate's going to go on for quite a long time. But um, we're going to have to end it there, I'm afraid. We've slightly overrun by a minute or so. But thank you to all of our three guests for giving their time to come and talk to us about this subject. And I hope that people watching got plenty out of it. I'm sorry we couldn't answer everyone's question, uh, but and, and uh, regards to Mark's um, presentation, if anyone wants it, we'll, we'll try and provide it to you somehow. We'll find a way of doing it. So uh, so thank you everyone for coming along. If you enjoyed this, we do plan to do more. This is the third one we've done. We haven't got one upcoming at the moment. We've got a couple of ideas though, so um, please sort of keep an eye out for future ones. You can follow us on our Facebook page or on Twitter at, at NN Alliance. You can sign up as a supporter at nnalliance.org to be added to the mailing list so you'll hear about future events such as this. Um, you can find and subscribe to our YouTube channel where we are currently publishing the webinars after they've happened, but we're hoping to maybe stream them in the future. Uh, and most of all, again, we rely on private donations, so please see our donate page on the web website, which lists, lists many options to help. Or if you're in the UK, just simply text NNA plus the donation amount to 70085. So um, from a place where it's ridiculously hot at the moment, um, thank you very much for everyone to come along. And if you're in a different part of the world, uh, have a pleasant time of day wherever you are. Um, so good night.